Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 36th episode of VisionCon Live, your go-to nerdy talk show. I'm your host, Zach Wilson. You didn't come here to see me today. You can't. You see the man of the hour. He's Neji from Naruto, Toshiro from Bleach, Griffith from Berserk, just to name a few. He's the acting legend whose powerful voice has brought to life countless powerful characters. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the one, the only, Steve Staley. Steve, how are you doing today? Oh, wow. I'm doing great after hearing that awesome introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, of course, of course. Steve, we got a lot to talk about, so I do want to go ahead and get right into the first question. Now, Steve Staley, you're a household name. Everybody knows you, or at least they're about to. <laughs> how did we get here? How, did we all, was this always the plan, being one of the most well-known voice actors and really actors out there? Or did something happen along the way that kind of got us here? No, I have an easy answer for that because even just the other day I was thinking to myself, what am I doing here? I, this is a 19-year-old put me here. A 19-year-old brought my ass out to California <laughs> and went for this acting thing. And here I am, a grown man, like, oh, my God, I'm still living out an adolescent fantasy. And I'm now I'm old. So uh, it couldn't be any better. So, yes, this was the plan. To be more specific, though, it, it falls into the category category what I call the Plinko of show business, which is okay. that once you drop your Plinko chip into the Los Angeles, living here, pursuing acting, show business, that chip can go anywhere, whether that leads to you being a producer one day, a PA, to moving home, to becoming famous, to blah, 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 blah. That, that's what happens in show business. That's been my experience and that's been my observation. And, uh, the Plinko of show business early on plinked me into this voiceover category where then the, the chip just kind of dropped forward. More to the point, I realized I had something going on in voiceover and I switched my focus there at a point in my mid twenties off of on camera acting, becoming a movie star, that whole thing. And felt I had a, something going on here that was worth uh, pursuing exclusively. Well, I still did commercials and stuff like that, you know, on camera, but then voiceovers just got too busy. Mm, sure. And was there a certain character or show that you did that kind of led that kicking off point to refocusing your focus on voice acting? No, that was really before before anything started happening for me. It mm. wasn't until I started really yeah. focusing on voiceovers that stuff started happening for me. It wasn't like I realized one day, oh, I sure do a lot of voiceovers. <laughs> Maybe I should, it was when I realized at the very beginning of it all that I was getting picked up on, that, that, that people were interested, that's when I switched over to voiceovers. So before I ever even did a job, I had switched over to pursuing voiceovers in my acting career, different from uh, on-camera acting. I mean, it overlapped for a lot of years, but my yeah, focus yeah. was always voiceovers because it was happening for me. And man, have you made a career throughout the years? Because I want to talk about, I want to talk about three big ones real quick. Uh, the Go first one, we all know them, we all love them, and I do want to preface that, you know, with these shows that we talk about, there might be some slight spoilers, so you guys have been warned. But the first character I want to talk about, of course, is Neji from Naruto. Now, I did want to ask, you know, Neji, you know, went through a huge character development with Naruto, Naruto Shippuden, Boruto, what have you. Oh my you. god, I just did a Neji job uh, two or three days ago from my closet. I mean, Naruto, the gift that keeps on giving. <sighs> God, yeah. So I did want to ask, voicing, you know, this character who, you know, had gone through all that character development, was there anything about Neji throughout the years that has kind of really stuck with you? I love that he's, in his own way, chill. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly is. I like a lot. Mm. That's been cool. Mm. I, I never thought that. I remember that audition very clearly, which is not always the case. Sure. But I remember that day going up to where the studio used to be all those years ago, et cetera, et cetera, and reading for all these parts, not knowing what this was, and everybody saying, oh, it's this thing. And I was like, wow, okay. Was there ever a moment where you kind of thought, at least leading in, that Naruto would be as big as it is today, and that Neji would no. be such? No. no. <laughs> is everyone giving you that answer? Because 
who gets a job in acting that they think is going to last 13, 14 years. Like I said, I just did a job, Neji, a couple of days ago. And a couple of months ago, he did a Neji video game. Not a Neji video game, but the yeah, part of Neji in a video game from my closet a couple of months ago. So no, who thought that that would part would go so many years? Never. Oh my God. Well, when you hear people talk about their favorite Naruto characters, it comes to a point where you think some people thought, I don't know, maybe the show's called Neji, actually, because Neji's such a beloved character. So when you go to conventions or just fans, you know, reach out to you, how often or how recognizable are you as Neji to them? Mm, I would say that's the, the, the top three you gave or the same top three that, <laughs> come, up, uh, sure. are, that come up always. Um, I feel like in my private li life interacting with people and things people send me and stuff, I say Neji and um, Toshiro are kind of neck and neck. Well, and speaking of Toshiro, how was your experience voicing Toshiro? And then as a follow-up, I mean, the guy, the guy definitely, when he does yell, he yells. And with a anime so kind of centric on these fight scenes, what's up? I have a great blooper. I don't have to be, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, with all the, these fight scenes in this anime, you know, does your voice ever get hoarse to the point that, you know, it becomes an issue? Not that it becomes an issue. And sure. I don't know if it's psychological, if it's comfort, but I used to be game for all of that. And now when I see a scream coming, I have to steal myself psychologically <laughs> to make sure that I am still going to give what needs to be given in order to make it right and not hold back because if you're going to hold back and scream anyway it still hurts so you got to give it all and i become very focused because i do not want to do more takes so i don't know if it hurts but i've certainly become more paranoid about it hurting over the years but then again this is the job that's what i tell myself so you do it so walk me through so you go to audition for toshiro and was there ever any thought that or ever any doubt rather that you either wouldn't get this role or when you did get the role was there did you ever imagine again that it would be this big of a show and that your character would be one of the most beloved characters in the show bleach yeah. is similar to naruto although sure. bleach kind of went away at hmm. a certain point although i do see it still in the oh, yeah. i guess the zeitgeist uh and i never thought it would go that long because it it had its own eight nine ten years uh worth of work and video games and stuff unlike naruto though i don't remember auditioning for bleach uh because at the time i'm sure i went somewhere to audition because this at home had not yet started which doing voiceovers at home's Mm, like 13 years ago is when we all had to start getting microphones to do auditions from home and stuff. So it's, it's not new for us to be doing this at home, but it was before that. Anyway, where I was headed is sometimes when you've got six emails and this many auditions and do four characters in this show, uh, audition like Toshiro might've been something that I just had to throw out. It's what my friend Adam calls the lottery, scratch and lottery tickets because I'm sending these auditions out, who knew that number three of those seven would be a 12 year long job. That's the, the way it works. Great gravy train of show business. <laughs> now, did you ever imagine, you know, your life obviously, you know, has gotten so many different roles throughout the years, but were there ever any ones, and it might be one of the characters that we'll talk to here in a little bit, but uh, are there any characters that you voiced throughout the years that you just, at the end of the day, gladly hang your hat on? To say it's mine or to say goodbye? Oh, my goodness. No, no, no. Just like the, some of your proudest characters that you've done. Oh, Kadaj. You know, that job, yeah. that job was a, oh, my God. It was grueling because of the way they worked different from the way I was used to working. And sure. they were taking it very seriously, of course, right? And I was... And so sometimes it would take 15 minutes or more to record one line. And um, I just wasn't used to working that way. No, it's not like I blew up. I'm telling you what was going on in my head. They had no, they had no idea. But in the, in the end, because I was trying to figure out how to 
to do my process and only give one line reading every <laughs> every 10 minutes yeah. after they, they they talked about it it pulled me into a focus because i was like oh my god imagine what's going to happen if i do this wrong and they're not happy and how long this is going to take uh even though i was being paid by the hour go figure um and it ended up being worth it and uh i just saw that movie a couple years ago again on a 10-year anniversary thing me and quentin went down uh, to Irvine uh, or fa Fashion Island and wa watched a screening in a movie theater. Uh, it was cool. And I was happy how it held up in my eyes in terms of what I felt about my work in that show. Oh my God. It holds up so well. I mean, to the point that, I mean, I've got the novelization of it right here. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> oh my God. So great. And for those of you who aren't familiar, Kadaj is the one of the central antagonists for Final Fantasy VII Advent Children. And yeah, yeah. holds up. This is also great to get to be the bad guy, you know? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Well, and speaking of bad guys, you voice one of the, in my opinion, and to many other opinions, one of the worst bad guys around. That, of course, is going to be Griffith from Berserk. Now, Griffith is an interesting case because People either, they all love the performance no matter what, but as the character, at least in a moral aspect, people either love him or absolutely loathe him. So what was your experience voicing Griffith? And did you kind of enjoy being one of the worst guys in anime history? Yeah, that was fun. That, I feel like that was a screamer, though. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely was. Yeah, that was when you say, so what do I think? I think, oh, that was a screamer. <laughs> um, but in a way, because of what I said to you earlier about screaming and stuff like that and the give that you have to find a way to do it, it made it almost better because I had to overcome what I kind of didn't really want to do, if that makes sense. Yeah. And also keep in mind, I had to take that over from someone else, if I recall. Yeah. And uh, I don't remember how much they were asking me to service that or bring something new like I remember that being a, um, a something that was there but what that required of me I don't really I don't really remember um, but it I think it turned out okay it also is one of the only it's also the show that is why I that I stopped looking online because somehow I was on YouTube and it was a clip clip of Griffith. I think I went there to because someone needed it as a prototype for some sure. thing I was doing and I had to go to listen to it. And I went there to listen to it and I went down and it was a whole conversation about, you know, me versus him and all that. And I was like, oh, oh, oh I don't want to know this. And it was, uh, I, I, that's when I was like, I will never read another comment section again as long as I live, which unfortunately means uh, I don't ever read any compliments either but i was like oh i don't need this to crash my I mean, day you can't please everybody and you know, I know I it's know. the internet which might be hyperbolic because you know this is on the internet too but you know it's the internet man people are mean uh, yeah i know because <laughs> so, i wasn't there for my own aggrandizement at, at reading the comments i was like oh my, this is what's going on i didn't, <laughs> I didn't even know but like I said, I thought, let's make sure we don't dive too deep into these in the future. Probably for the best. But, you know, you kind of brought up an interesting point that I do want to explore a little bit. I did want to ask you, what is your process when kind of bringing your own spin to a character? So do you take, when you get cast as, you know, a new character, how do you establish their voice? Well, it's important. This, I'm pausing because maybe sure. before I started directing, I would give you a different answer. So now <laughs> my answer ha comes from the director. It's a collaboration between the director, the actor, and then who, what I always call management, client, you know, whatever that means, management, people then who are my boss and what they want and what they're looking for. And then you just dial it in uh, through takes, retakes, uh, messing around, trying something new, sure. and um, ultimately land on something that then you record it, obviously, and you can play it back to find it again. As the actor, it's interesting when you're the actor, how much actually being at work is more about doing what you're 
told than standing there originating, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So you are creating, but you're basing it off instructions, if that makes sense. You are not just given free reign. Make it a little darker. No, that's too deep. Don't sound like, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, so I would call it a dialing in process because you're not just serving your own artistic impulses. You're serving the people who are, who show it is, who are paying you, right? It's their thing, not yours as the actor. And it was interesting for me to come to Hollywood and then start working and then start working so much that I could take it for granted, if that makes sense, to where I can perceive it just as a job. And when I started perceiving it as a job, I realized how much it's their show. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. You're invited to be part of it. You're being paid, et cetera, but it is not your show. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you did mention something that I do want to touch on, but before then, we're about at the halfway point. So guys, plenty of you have already either messaged VisionCon directly or messaged your comments and questions in the live chat. You guys still have some time to do so because, again, we're about the halfway point, but I just want to mention that. As well as, if you're watching this live on Facebook, put a bunch of links attached to Steve Staley in the live chat, or if you're watching this later on YouTube, it's going to be down there in the description box below. But with that said, so you've mentioned... You're a director as well, Steve. And I got to ask, I mean, is there any time throughout the day just to breathe? The thing, (laughs) either acting or directing and dubbing, you have to be there the whole time. There is no looking the other way because there's four people waiting (laughs) waiting for you. (laughs) That's a fair point. Yes, between sessions, it's a very mellow, it's very mellow actually. And, uh, there's just a lot to get done and it takes all day. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's fun to create it because I just, the joke I made when I started directing was if I don't know how to do this, then what do I know how to do? And so it feels good because I'm, um, I'm good at it. So I don't have to struggle with it. And it's, I got a way of doing it that in a way I get the free reign I don't get as an actor. They now have to do it my way. And then I get, I get to act out. <laughs> now is me acting out the way i want it to go if that makes sense totally makes sense sense. that's what i base it on i base it on how i want it to go and then there it is and i feel like it it works yeah so how did we fall into uh directing did it did it preclude acting or was it definitely something that you got into after you were already an established actor oh yeah way after it's all one and the same right you get into this thing and you work and you have some jobs that your agent sends you on where they're strangers and you never see them again. And then there are people who you work with all the time. And then over time, you all look back and realize, oh my God, remember when I was 25 and I met you and we thought we were getting old, you know? And then you realize, so you've just known people a long time and uh, people's needs and people's skill sets come together because you're, you're on the list. And I was interested at the time when Eric asked me, I thought, yeah, that does seem like something I would like because the acting lifestyle, uh, I wanted a little, something a little more regular. I'm not even really talking about money. I'm talking about something to do that, that is not just waiting for uh, voiceover auditions and jobs, waiting for the phone to ring proverbially. Sure. And so directing has given me that. Oh, excellent. And what are some of the things that you are directing both in the past and you are currently directing? I feel like I've been so lucky to direct the coolest shows. Season one and two of Kakagarui is where it started. Um, of course, more currently, Promised Neverland and Demon Slayer. And um, gosh, Ico we did last summer. Of, of course, I should have written it down. <laughs> those are, those are the, the, the main ones that I've been spending a lot of time a couple of gundam build divers gundam build divers re-rise like 50 episodes of that show and uh they're all very well received and pretty cool i promise neverland was so oh my god promise neverland shattered me wasn't that like rad i it was well it was just like i wasn't i didn't read the manga beforehand so i didn't know the big like reveal of what the show that you know on paper presents itself as very cutesy and not but oh, oh my, my god. god and if you really think about it it's horrifying right oh, god. Got- it's terrible i mean it's terrible in the best way possible <laughs> totally but it it i can't explain it it just was so everything about it was not like an anime i can't so explain different. what i mean by that maybe you know no. what i mean by that no, i absolutely it was very it was different it was unique and i know that word those two words get thrown around a lot but i cannot think 
of a better way to use those words than Promise Neverland. It was not your typical anime. It, was, it didn't follow a formula that I recognized, except it totally did. Yeah. Yeah, it did, and it didn't. It's the perfect anime. If you're not a fan, if you're a fan of typical anime, you'll be a fan of this because, you know, it's amazing. But if you're usually kind of, you know, hauled it off on anime, Promise Neverland is definitely one I would recommend just because it yeah, doesn't... it plays out like a horror movie. Yeah. It's, it, it, it does suspense almost better than any an- anime I've ever seen. Without a doubt. It's the tension that it's holding it all the time because you're waiting for the hammer to come down. Yeah, yeah. And 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 when it does, oh my God, it does. But with that, these next two questions. Yes, go ahead. Two questions, Steve. Uh, I did want to ask, with the thought of knowing that, so a lot of people who watch the show obviously are here for the wonderful guests that we have, like the one right before me. But... Also, people watch the show because they're either in the entertainment industry or want to get in the entertainment industry and just need to know what to do. So, with someone as successful and well-known as you, keep those things in mind. Because the first question I want to ask you is a rejection. Now, we all know rejection is a common thing in just life in general. However, I would argue that if there was ever an industry that rejection is most prominent, I would argue that your industry, otherwise known as the entertainment industry, would be that industry. So, with someone as successful and prevalent as you, how do you deal with rejection? Does it get any easier? Or if it doesn't, how do you deal with rejection? I, of course, understand what you're talking about. And similar to the way I was saying I don't pursue attention or I'm pretty mellow and all that, that has come into play in my acting career. And my answer to your question is, for whatever reason, this was no choice I made or meditation I did. I have never perceived it as rejection. That does not mean that I have not been disappointed to have six callbacks for something and not get it. But that's just disappointment. Always, there's just tomorrow. I I just never, I, I think it's because I have been lucky enough to always have something to look forward to that looking back does not, I'm already thinking about the next thing. Like I said, like Yutsugaya coming out of a stack of seven auditions for all I know that day. That's what I have to do when I wake up. And so you do those and you get some and you lose more than you get always. So when that's just the way it is, I have never perceived it as rejection. And I know people, I remember meeting people when I was younger who were the older mentor types who said they got out because they couldn't handle the rejection. Um, To be sure, it's tough in show business. I feel like I'm the thick... I have the thickest skin for a thin skin person ever. <laughs> you have to do with a lot of talk right to your face <laughs> about yourself. And uh, there is a, a nobody cares about you vibe, which is what I think you're calling rejection. And that is very strong. So I think it must come down to a sense of, um, I don't know, self that I must have (laughs) that I don't even necessarily am aware, that I'm not even necessarily aware of because I've never perceived it as uh, rejection. Maybe that's because I had enough, uh, enough people tell me when I was younger about rejection that I was able to enter into it with a very fair minded approach, knowing that acting is going to it's just the way it is. That's a, that's a very unique perspective. I mean, we've had, what, this is episode 36, so 35 guests before you all answer that question, and I have not heard any of them ever say any one thing like that. It's very interesting. It really, does it come off too philosophical? Or is oh, God, it, no. Uh, no, no, if anything, that was a sage-like advice. I, I think it is when I hear myself say it, but the, I just am lucky. It's grace, really, that yeah. I have never felt that that was rejected. Again, my feelings have been hurt. I have been embarrassed, right? That, that has all happened, but it wasn't like because I wasn't good enough. Um, even when I fail a little bit, I'm like, they're lost. Like me and my friend, I, if anyone knows the actress Melinda McGraw, we were talking one day about coming out of auditions. And I was like, I gotta be honest. When I walk out of an, an audition, I'm like, I don't know how they could rationally pick anyone except me. And she laughed and she's like, I think the same thing too. And then she said, you know what? If you don't think that way when you're walking out of an audition, you you shouldn't be doing it. And we had a little private little laugh about that because I don't really think that. But 
that that's kind of how we were and we were joking about our own egos really is that we were sure. walking out of these auditions like yeah. ha, what you know send everybody else home the position has been filled <laughs> well you have to go in there with some confidence i would assume i yes but i don't feel confident does that make sense <laughs> That's where this fr the other phrase I learned when I was in a fucking children's show that has stood me through my whole career, which is acting brave is the same as being brave. And when I really it was able to internalize that, I was like, oh yeah, that's the truth. It's the, <laughs> it's the we can build a zoo. If anyone saw that cute little Matt Damon movie, but there was a thing about that you only have to be brave for 20 seconds. And those, maybe they're maxims, platitudes, I don't know, but... Yeah. It's the truth. Acting brave is the same as being brave. And when I kind of really was able to grasp that, I can walk in with confidence and realize that that's really what people want from someone. And that I, I'm not trying to uh, suck any oxygen. I am just okay with being an example of letting your light shine. <laughs> Woo! Fucking talk about sage like advice. <laughs> well, <laughs> speaking of sage like advice, so like I said, people watch this show you know, to get some of the, you know, insight and tips. So let's pretend for a moment I am everybody who's watching back at home that wants to either be in the entertainment industry or already is and just wants to know where to go next. What kind of tips would you give the folks watching at home that you maybe wish you had when you first started out? I wish I had started acting class earlier. I mean, I got a degree in theater, right? So I got acting training in college, but the acting training in college is different than acting training if you are really going to go for it to, to, make, to make a living. And I wish I'd started acting class earlier because of just everything I got out of it. I'm not a legacy, meaning I didn't come to show business because I had family in it, which is an easier entree because their skill set is inherited to you because of what they know. And... Um, so I, I, a lot of that I had to learn in acting class and I learned it early. And I always recommend in my classes when I was teaching for many years at Kalmanson and Kalmanson, a distinguished casting agency here in LA that also teaches classes that, um, uh, well, I forgot what it was. <laughs> 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 out of my, I've got on my own twisted, tell me what I was talking about. You were talking about uh, tips that you give the folks watching at home. You ah. talk about the classes you used to teach. Classes, that's where I yes. was headed, yes. Uh, that um, you have to dig in deep and I wish I had dug in deep earlier with sure. acting class was my answer to your question, my long sure. answer. Absolutely. Well, now you guys know all the tips you need become the next Steve Staley. Now, before we go on to our next segment, guys, this is your last chance. If you haven't already, either message VisionCon directly or put it in the live chat, your viewers' comments and questions because ladies and gentlemen, we're in the plug zone. Steve Staley, now is your chance to plug, promote, advertise, whatever verb you want to use, anything you want. The floor is yours, sir. All right, let's go. Well, I already just gave a shout out to my friends at Kalmanson's. I'm not actually sure what's going on there with uh, COVID happening, um, but I do. There's a lot of action online. You know, Betty Buckley teaches a, uh, a, uh, a monologue class online, which I was like, that would be fun just to take. Um, I, if, if my Twitter and my Instagram were more interesting, I would promote them. But if you like to look at pictures of airplanes, then my Instagram has some really great airplane pictures <laughs> on it. Um, otherwise, COVID has been so boring. Uh, I would tell you to look up Promise Neverland, to watch Demon Slayer, and then await the Demon Slayer movie that's uh, coming up, which turned out to be some kind of big, huge hit in Japan, as far as I understand. And check out Kakagurui. These the uh, fun show full of women it's a great show for girls i mean it has some cliche uh, anime tropes in it but it's a great show for girls yeah. and um currently also working on the misfits of demon academy uh there you go plug yeah. it yeah and fans of demon slayer make sure to tune in next sunday live for us because we'll have kira buckland also known as mitsuri from Demon Slayer. But with that. I had her this week or last weekend for a session. Different show, but. Sure. Ah, oh, she's so sweet, though. I love her. Right, but with that, guys, we're out of the plug zone and going right 
interviewers, comments, and questions. So guys, like I usually do, I'm just gonna split it 50-50 between the messenger and the live chat. So going to the live chat first, got a lot of people saying hi, Steve. And we got, okay, so my boy Aaron tuned in and I want to ask, which Disney couple would you want Rio and Rika to double, triple date with? Lady and the Tramp, Ariel and Eric, Belle and Beast, or Hercules and Meg? Uh, Ariel and Eric. Okay, any, any reasoning behind it? Because that's who I would choose. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair, you just saw the reason you need. <laughs> All right, Nikki tuned in and wanted to, uh, there's two questions. First, can you do some character, vo blah, 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 character voicing for us? You mean like? Let's say. Ask me to they, do a, uh, they didn't specify, so let's go with Neji and uh, Toshiro, why not? Well, who? <laughs> so okay. their, exactly their name, the is same, name as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, Neji, everything Neji does though is very serious. Just send them anyway and I'll go ahead and have the marketing department put them in live chat. <laughs> very, very serious. You nailed it. You nailed it. Let's do uh, for posterity. Let's let's for posterity. Let's do Kadaj. Uh, mother's mimetic legacy. That's what I always say for Kadaj. Mother's mimetic legacy. Ah, knocked it out of the park. Hell yeah! All right. And then so they also wanted to ask, uh, what next are you going to be doing for movies or games? Any hints? Uh, thank you. I, I am so glad because I left out up in, in the plug zone, but it is also the answer to this question. There you go. <laughs> uh, Guild Wars 2, which is also a job that I have had for many years and is, uh, frankly, an amazing job. And they have expansion after expansion. And in fact, I'm going in to record on uh, Tuesday morning for the more lines and they have a ton of lines so it's a, an amazing and deep deep show that's been going on for a long time game uh game show right you know what i'm saying yeah. and uh it's super cool and i play asura male asura male sure pc <laughs> <laughs> script. well alexander tuned in and wanted to know what are some of your fondest memories with being involved in the gundam series I have been involved with Gundam now for a long time because one of my first jobs when I was, you know, in my twenties was Gundam Mobile, Gundam Eighth Mobile Infantry, and um, I think it was probably one of my first leading roles. And I didn't know what Gundam was, and that's when I learned what Gundam was. And then I remembered I was like, I had visions of having seen Gundams before, you know, around. I just didn't know what they they were, and so that role holds a special place for me because it was where I learned about Gundam. And then there were plenty of parts on Gundam this, Gundam that throughout the years until uh, Benazir Lynx came along. And I wasn't aware that that was even going to be a big part when I got it. And then there it was, this whole arc. That was, there was a lot going on with him in that show. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, there, that. <laughs> well, uh, Courtney tuned in and wanted to ask, what are some things you like to do outside of voice acting? Well, when we're not in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> sure. Over the years, I have become a, I guess not a Disney file, but a Disneyland file. Okay. <laughs> like, I love Disney, but I'm not, I don't, pin trade or I don't care about Disney anymore or any less than anything else but I love going to Disneyland and Disney California Adventure so I go down there a lot with my friends who also enjoy going down there and it's something fun to do that you don't have to um, plan necessarily uh, I like that and as far as more personal things I like to uh, garden bum that it's winter because I, I've had to Pull, pull all my plants in. Haven't had to really take up any of my bulbs yet, but all my bulbs have now gone because it's November. No. no. Uh, so I like doing that. <laughs> well, Nick tuned in and wanted to know, do you like voicing Griffith or Femto the most? I hope I pronounced that correctly. I, do, I don't remember what Femto was, I gotta be honest. 
So I guess I'll say Griffith. There you go. <laughs> Easy answer. <laughs> uh, I would, if, you, if I saw it, I would go, oh, yes, of course, that, but the list I'm sometime. It. I'm on it. Well, while, while I look this up, I'll read the yes. other, another question. Okay, so Jordan tuned in and wanted to know, are there any characters that you voiced throughout the years that you wish got more credit? Or I, I, I assume they mean yes, like- I have an answer for that. Absolutely. But it's not enough credit. I don't have a chip or anything, but I have always had a special place in my heart for the show Heat Guy J. And I can't remember, I think it might have only been 12 episodes or something like that. Oh, well, maybe not. That was a long time ago. Anyway, I just loved the way that show looked. And I liked that character, Shiro Amada, and Bob Happenbrook played the robot guy. And he was so good. I just loved that little show. And I had, it was on MTV2, actually, for a, a minute when that was something. And, um, Eh, that that was it. But boy, did I like that show. Do you even do you even know that show? I don't, unfortunately. I mean, I want to now. Heat Guy J. J. I'll have to look it up. Be, like I said, it might only be like twelve episodes. It's not hard to get through. And then I just finished just looking up who Femto. So apparently, Femto is actually Griffith as well. It's um. Ah, oh, that was a trick question. Well, no, I guess uh, I guess Griffith is uh, or Femto is when Griffith becomes like that demon hawk thing. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, you learn something new every day. All right. Well, we got time for one more question, guys, and I'm gonna go to my girl Connie, who wanted to know. Are there any rough parts of being famous or being a well-known voice actor? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy. I couldn't, I couldn't be luckier. Like I said, I, I really am here on a 19-year-old's choice of what to do with his life. You know what I mean? That doesn't mean I don't have passion for what I do, but this is, th this is just a fruition of what, has, what I set out to do when I was still a teenager. And... Um, so that's very gratifying and uh, a choice that could have gone wrong, you know what I mean? Did not go wrong and I couldn't be happier or more grateful that people care, you know? Thank you for caring. These shows are fun. Well, can't think of a better note to leave on. So ladies and gentlemen, this has been episode 36 of Vision Con Live. And before we wrap things up, Steve Staley, any final thoughts to leave us on? Keep watching. Tune in. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god wow. oh my god i can i can reiterate <laughs> that one ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for watching episode 36 of vision cons live thank you guys so much for tuning in of course i'm your host zach wilson but much more importantly this has been my very special guest steve staley make sure to check out all the links down in the description box below and until next time guys always remember that life's better when you have friends to share it with